We are honored uh, today to be in the office uh, here in Moscow with General Alexei Leonov. General, thank you very much for spending the time with us today. 2015 represents two of the most important anniversaries in human spaceflight history. They both involve you. The 50th anniversary of man's first spacewalk and the 40th anniversary of Apollo Soyuz. Uh, it's hard to believe that this much time has passed, but looking back at that time, what, uh, what did those days mean to you personally, and uh, are the memories of those accomplishments as significant today as they were when you lived through those 50 years ago and 40 years ago? Uh, uh, let me start with some uh, events that took place prior to that. How did I happen to have become a part of this goal, of this task? Very recently, in the minutes of one of the meetings, we have found the following statement. And this takes us back to Mr. Korolev running one of the meetings where they were supposed to shape up the actual uh, first EVA session that I was supposed to be a part of and what he said about me. I would like to outline the most important feature of Mr. Dionov, and this is his wit, his uh, ability to quickly act, his ability to guess correctly, his ability to accept technical materials, excellent character. He is an artist, he is a very sociable person, he is a very kind and hospitable person. He is very courageous, courageous fighter pilot. He has enough knowledge and ability to operate a variety of different uh, aircraft. And I think that this person uh, strongly deserves our attention. That's what Mr. Korolev told about me, which I never knew. And these words determined my fate, determined my destiny. And then the issue came up as to who is going to be the first one to go EVA. He said, we do have a candidate. This year, I visited Mr. Korolev's daughter. And she let me listen to a recording on the first press conference, which uh, Mr. Korolev uh, was involved in talking to a number of media uh, people. And he said that in order for us to conquer the, war, the space, we need to learn how to operate outside of the space vehicle in order to build space stations in order to provide each other with appropriate assistance. We need to learn how to dock, how to work together, not only with our vehicles, but with the vehicles belonging to different countries. And back then, for the first time, it occurred to me that I was the one to make it happen. And in this regard, I strongly feel that I'm very happy because I managed to have resolved those two difficult tasks that, ha that had an enormous impact on the subsequent activities in space. And I'm very glad that I was involved in those activities. And if we are to look back at what was happening 50 years ago, I don't think anybody ever would have been able to actually sign off on the event that involved EVA activities. And this is something that Boris Chertok, very famous engineer uh, of uh, Russia, s said once. The most uh, vivid impression of my life has to do with the fact that not only was I in a space vehicle, but I found myself to be surrounded with the stars. Stars were on the right-hand side, and uh, the Earth was on the left-hand side, and it was just an enormous, 
unbelievable вот silence, which is something that comes back to me as a reminiscence of my first flight. Uh, as you moved outside of the uh, Vascod spacecraft, uh, Pavel Belyaev, your crewmate, uh, was watching very carefully. You wrote in an article for Air and Space magazine uh, several years ago that you felt like a seagull with its wings outstretched, soaring high above the Earth. What, what was that experience like? It was a very short spacewalk, but you had great recollections of it. Well, well, this feeling is just the uh, perception of space, the perception of environment. And what I saw, and I saw just half of the world, because we were 500 kilometers above the Earth. And uh, nobody, even up, up until now, nobody is flying that high. So I saw a radius of half of the planet of Earth and the ability to see the whole Earth as a globe, pretty much, is something that was extremely attractive. And I could easily recognize the Black Sea the Crimea, Romania, Bulgaria, Italy, looking up a little bit, Baltic Sea, and it was all within minutes, if not seconds. But the most uh, impression had to do with the silence. And I, I heard how my heart was pounding. I could hear myself breathe. And I, I remembered Arthur Clarke and Stanley Kubrick, who, while doing the Space Odyssey, they worked a lot on the, uh, a lot on the soundtrack. And this, the, the way the uh, crew members used to breathe during this uh, movie was very impressive. And uh, the uh, images that I have that show a person with his hands widespread, which is a symbolic representation of a seagull, although to me it's uh, more like a paratrooper in a free flight. This uh, analogy is closer to me personally, but once again, silence. These stars were very bright, there was a lot of them. And what, it was interesting that they were everywhere. They were above and they were beneath. And on the ground we can only see stars up in the sky. In space, they are everywhere. And it depends on how good a vision of an individual is, but uh, in space we see much smaller stars. It was a very short spacewalk, but in the brief time you were outside, did you have a sense that you were making history, that you were the, the first, the pathfinder of uh, spacewalk activity that later would become a standard and staple and very critical facet of human spaceflight? <laughs> yeah. I, I thought about that prior to the flight, but during the flight, the only thing I could think of was to concentrate and to perform everything that I was supposed to. I was thinking about the spacesuit, I was thinking about the necessity to stay focused, but not only was I thinking about the immediate step I was supposed to make, but also on the next step. But I never thought that I'm doing anything that uh, is heroic. Otherwise, it would uh, end it probably badly. While you were outside of the airlock of your spacecraft, uh, your spacesuit encountered uh, a deformation, if you will, uh, that uh, threatened your ability to get back inside for a while. How did you? Uh, overcome this problem? What was the problem and how did you overcome it to successfully end the space war? Prior to the flight, I was uh, doing a lot of training in the vacuum chamber, imitating the uh, uh, altitude of 60 kilometers, which is a 
a deadly area for a, an average human being. And I was lying in the chair trying to overcome and uh, work out the belief in what I was wearing as a means of protection. Up until now, nowhere on the planet of Earth, in Russia or in the United States, we have any vacuum chambers that would allow to actually test the spacesuit to be flown on the elevations of 400 kilometers or so. It's just not feasible. So we could expect almost anything. The design of the spacesuit was uh, rated as far as pressure for a nominal uh, pressure of 760 and then half of this pressure. And I did have a device that would allow me to drop the pressure had it became necessary. And I knew how to do that. But I had to understand that if I decide to drop the pressure, I could actually uh, pose myself into a very uh, deadly situation because the nitrogen in uh, my uh, blood would come to boil. But once again, I was trained to do that. I knew how to do it. And then during the eighth minute, I all of a sudden realized that my fingers got loose and they kind of came off the glove. And inside the glove, I've, I've immediately realized that I have got to do something because I cannot go on with this uh, spacesuit. And particularly, I will not, I will not be able to return to the uh, vehicle because I had a tether which was five and a half meters long. And I was supposed to roll it up. And every 40 minutes, I had a... Uh, O-ring, which I was supposed to actually put on a hook. If I won't do it, I will not be able to get back to the airlock. But with the gloves like this, I was never uh, able to actually do it. I also need to uh, remove the camera. And What's important, that I was just levitating. These days it's very uh, simple. We put a crew member on the uh, foot restraint and with both hands available, he can do anything. But back then there was no such a technique. And we just didn't have guessed that this is something that is possible. So I, my one hand was always occupied with actually uh, grabbing something in order to stay close to the vehicle. And during the eighth minute of the EVA, I've realized that the uh, space suit was behaving in such a way that I cannot continue like this anymore and I will not be able to get back to the airlock. Something needed to happen. So what should I do? What should I have done? Drop the pressure. In five minutes, I was supposed to be in eclipse. And in the eclipse, with the gloves like that, I will not be able to roll up the uh, tether. And then I silently violating every single rule and regulation without reporting anything to the ground, I dropped the pressure to 0.27 atmosphere. Uh, and at that point, I realized that I'm going to be in real trouble, in real sorry pickle. But I knew that I'm getting closer to the area where the nitrogen is supposed to come to boil, or maybe not. But I didn't have any choice. I didn't have any recourse. And the, uh, the way... Uh, we do used to do this pressure differential. It was not a smooth process. It was step by step. So it's, I decided to go ahead and drop the pressure and nothing happened. And for about an hour, I was on pure oxygen. But everything 
came back to normal. The gloves went back to normal and I felt differently. Looks like the danger associated with this inadequate spacesuit was taken care of. And what I have done, I removed the camera and I tried to kind of break the spacesuit in order to get back to the airlock with my uh, legs first. And after that, I did manage to do so. And after that, I've done a fantastic thing. I was grabbing a camera. I moved the camera to the hatch. And then I grabbed the lines using my second hand and went back into the airlock with my head first. And I won. But inside, I was supposed to turn back because in, eventually I had to go to the vehicle with my legs first. And on the other hand, if I would not have managed to close the hedge, I was supposed to actually secure it manually. But before doing that, I needed to make sure that nothing had gotten into the interface. So I returned, and, and that was by far the most difficult thing. With the hedge of 190 uh, centimeters, an airlock actually had a different size hedge. And I really don't know how I managed to uh, turn and go with my uh, legs first. And I was running a fear at that time. I was sweating. I could not see much because of the sweat. And then when I eventually made it back to the vehicle, so without even closing the internal hedge, which was another violation, I've decided to just remove sweat from my forehead and my eyes. And I was trying to do that, but I couldn't because the sweat was coming back. I mean, if I decide to run 10 kilometers, in my clothes, I probably wouldn't have been sweating nearly as much. I was running fever, like I said. So, everything happened the way it should, in my view. And after that, I was thinking for a long time, uh, what kind of consequences I would have to uh, deal with for violation of those uh, uh, rules and I know that the punishment was in plans. That's how it happened. But the most important thing that on the ground we've been doing a lot of rigorous training. So I was prepared how to drop pressure. I've done that because of the quality of training. Although we never assumed that something like that is in fact going to happen. But we have got to be prepared. Alexei Leonov, uh, you are a great man. We appreciate your time today and um, an icon of human spaceflight. Thank you so much for your time today.